Hello everybody and welcome back to the A to Z of Property Strategies with the Professors of Property, Mr. DJ David Clouter and the incredible Mr. Andrew Roberts. Well, thank you, David. And David, last time when we were negotiating, he lost the negotiation on the house, but he did win the negotiation that today we're here in the jungle. So we're off on our holes again, everybody. Because I picked up a few tips from you. I was learning from the best. And if you haven't seen last week's episode, do go and have a look at it again, because it's an absolute cracker. It's one of our best so far, I think. It, it was phenomenal. We were down there in the submarine and, well, we just navigated into the jungle. And what it a did. fabulous we, place. We beached the submarine and it's stuck now we can't get it off because the propeller isn't going around properly so that's why i'm wearing this because I'll, I'll be sort of waving at times during the um, um uh, video today to try and catch the attention of the rescue helicopters that are looking for us and they're going to winch us out of here at the end and my my little bright shirt here well we sort of camouflage in don't we Not well absolutely because i might uh, encourage the pterodactyls or whatever's in in, in the uh, in the jungle here to uh, to come and go for us but as soon as they see Andrew's shirt, they'll be off. I was just having a look through the uh, through the woodland there. Wow, hey. that really was good. I, I, I tell you, <laughs> the creatures. I, I'm just in a sloth, sort of up there. Wow. It didn't just move very far or past, very yeah. fast, but it was certainly a sloth. It will still be there later on, I think. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's one of them little frogs. You know the little frogs? Them poison dart oh. frogs. Oh, oh yeah. He's no bigger than my little fit. Look how big he is. He's no it's bigger insane. than my fit. So, family. are we going to do the whole of today's talk in our David Attenborough voice, or will we I be not? So. I think so. Where, where were we up to, David? Um, we were up to uh, N, and uh, the next one, which is a difficult one, I always hand the difficult ones over to you, because uh, that's what I'm like, you know, uh, shameless. It's net present value. Dun, dun, dun. Yikes. Oh, David, you give me the good ones, don't you? Net present value. Well, what can I say? Let, let's look at this from the point of view of I've got two properties to invest in. Property A, it's a small little bungalow, cost me 100000 and I'm sitting there with a rental income of £500 a month. Property B is another small property it's a two bed terraced house it cost me 120000 and it generates 525 pound a month now which one is the better spending the extra 20000 pound for the extra 25 pound a month or saving the 20000 pound putting it towards a deposit for another property and getting 25 pound a month less rent so what we'll do is look forwards and project our cash flow forwards and let's say take an arbitrary 10 years and there's a thing called what, what what's it called when money gets worth less each year david oh inflation inflation so there's a thing called inflation and my one pound buys me less every year because the price of a loaf of bread goes up every year so what we have to do is account for inflation and net present value basically is saying if we forecast 10 years worth of cash flows and compared project a versus project b bungalow versus two bed terraced which one is better well the answer to that is we calculate the net present value over a lifetime of the project which in this case is 10 years now, because we're looking over a 10 year window, what we are seeing is that one pound in today's money in 10 years time discounted back so that we can work out what it's worth today, which is basically the pound to the power of 10 discounted back. Now, that gives us a figure which in 10 years time, that pound might only buy 65 pence worth of bread in year five it might be buying 80 pence worth of bread 
So we discount all of those pounds back and compare them in today's value. Now, when comparing the two projects, A and B, that's effectively discounted it for the inflation and brings all of the money into today's terms. So if I was getting a return on project A, I'd invest all the money at one pound and I'd be getting it back in one pound, 98p, 95p, 92p and so forth over each year because the pound becomes worth less. And if the resultant answer on that over the 10 year window was that we got say £10,000 worth of rent in today's net present value the £525 because we've had to pay out the £20,000 in £1 but we're only getting back in the £525 in 80 pences by the time we're at year 5 that is worth much less as cash flow so we might find that that works out at £9,500. So spending less money and getting a lower rent could be worth more than spending a lot more money and only getting a marginally higher rent in today's terms. Now, there is a function in Excel. So for those people who like to use their spreadsheets, it's equals NPV. Then put the amount of funds invested comma, the discount rate, comma, and then the range of cash flows coming in. So it will basically calculate that value in today's terms. Now, net present value and internal rate of return work in parallel with each other. One works in one direction, one works in the other. Internal rate of return expresses itself as a percentage. Net present value expresses itself as a cash figure. So that, that's a very quick wrap up for you, David. I hope I, yeah. I kept it simple and not too complex. Perfect. And it's a way of comparing two different things that might otherwise be quite difficult to compare. Yeah, that's it. It brings an apple and a banana into comparison. Something, Something I've always wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, bananas in the jungle. Yeah, not many apples or pears here in this particular jungle, um, but other exotic fruits as well. I can see pineapples over there. I've got a coconut just to the left of me. <laughs> now, um, we, 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 we now move all the way from N, this big leap into the letter um, O, that's the one. And um, O... Really? O. Oh. One of the things O stands for, which could apply to us right now, is overseas. Um, the idea of, of, of getting this um, hut in the jungle kind of propped up above ground height because of the tigers and things, a bit higher than they can climb with a little ladder... Should we? Is it worth investing in overseas properties um, as a UK person? Because we we know, for example, that a lot of overseas investors c come here to the UK to to, to to put their funds into, for example, London and this, this kind of thing. So um, should we do the same thing in reverse? Uh, that, 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 that's the question. It is. Uh, when you said O's, I was thinking you were going to say we were overdressed by some small <laughs> stroke of the imagination. Well, but for me, this this is pretty modest, uh, I have to tell you. Absolutely, absolutely. I've seen you in your DJ gear, that glittery suit of yours and shiny slick shirt. But hey, uh, hey let's, let's not go there. Let's stay with overseas property, which there's an interesting conundrum here because you've got property price inflation where the price of the property goes up. So are they coming over here for the property price inflation? Are they coming over here? for the rental income the fact that when the money's remitted back to them it's worth more to them there or are they looking to retain it here and grow a pot of sterling yes, yes. alternatively are they looking for the exchange rate arbitrage where i know because uh, i lost out on a particular transaction to a, a spanish company who bought uh, a building over here in the uk they basically were able to outbid me because their pound, my pound versus their euro was worth less. So they could basically outbid me on a transaction because they'd got the benefit of the exchange rate, i.e. the euro was stronger than the pound at the time. Now, they don't actually need the property prices to appreciate. All they need is the currency to appreciate and they can make a gain. 
So there's different reasons why people invest in overseas yes. property. And then there's the more leisure interest, like we're in our leisure environment now. Absolutely. And, and, and um, then st- quite a lot of the investors who buy the very, very expensive properties over here uh, live in countries which are not as uh, democratic and free as ours. And they might even have exchange controls. So they're looking to get this money out of these, these countries, possibly in a suitcase or stuffed down the inside of the trouser leg or something. And once it's over or, or other means are available um, and, and um, uh, once it's over here, they just want to put it into a safe uh, place. So, so some of the huge buildings in London were, were, were just empty for a long time because uh, the owners just wanted to park the money somewhere and because of possibly because of inst- political instability at home or because of the fact that they might have to run away quickly or something like that. So, so that, that, that's you know another sort of slight factor. This exchange rate thing reminds me of something that happened in um, Eastern Europe and that would have been probably about 20, 25 years ago where, where people were offered... Very at, at a time when the local currencies were inflating at 20% per annum or something like this, they, they were offered these very, very, very cheap mortgages in Swiss francs, which a lot of people went, went for. The exchange uh, thing was not explained to them. It wasn't explained that it was at risk. And they ended up paying about four times as much as the other people that invest in the local currency because of changes in, in, in the exchange rate between their local currency and a very stable one like the Swiss franc. So that's certainly another thing to, to take into into account. And, um, you know, we, we can only speculate, I suppose, why uh, people from overseas might want to invest in the UK. So if we now turn the whole thing on its head, why might people from the UK want to, for example, I don't know, buy a house in Spain? I can't think of a single reason, David, can you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it might be Booking.com's got something to do with it. Other portals exist, uh, such as Airbnb. There is that. That Funny me not to have noticed that. Now, when, when you're buying these properties, uh, especially in, in those parts of the world, there, there is a bit of diligence to be done because some, some of the locals do have this habit of knocking something up without the proper permissions. And then the, uh, the, the, the local um, authority will come along and, and probably bulldoze it. And that happened to a friend of mine, actually, in the good old US of A, where he bought these two properties, which were a bit ramshackle, in a kind of suburban area. And it took because it took him about six months to, to, to get out there and because they've got quite strict and, and rapidly enforced uh, controls on how the area should look. It's not just a question of your front lawn is a bit overgrown. So it's a question of uh, your, your front, your garden, your whole property is a complete eyesore. Uh, the local mun- municipality did him a wonderful favour and came and demolished them and sent him the bill. So, so there are, yeah, there are things in, in, in terms of investing as a, as a Brit in overseas property, things that you might otherwise overlook, perhaps. Well, taxation's another one people are often overlook. And where is that money taxed? Uh, and when it comes back to the UK, tax here in the yeah. UK. Yeah. The other thing, uh, looking at the property side of things, is... One's brain has just gone empty. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I'm thinking, let me nip in at this point and give you a chance to tank up slowly. Um, I'm thinking of this um, this, um, stamp duty surcharge. If your only other property is this beautiful villa in Portugal, do you have to pay 3% on the first one you buy here? Now, uh, 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 that is a question, and I don't know the answer to that. I'll just leave that one out there. I was going to say that's a good question. Any experts on stamp duty, drop an answer in the box below as to what you think. But what I was going to say before I suddenly had a brain freeze moment was certain territories or or countries have particular rules. So you can own overseas property in their territory. However, you can't pass it down in your estate to your next generation. So you do have to consider the methods of ownership and disposal prior to your demise because... You might own it and then it gets seized by the state because you can't pass it on. So mm. worth worth digging and delving. <laughs> Sorry about that. Absolutely. That was a brilliant brain freeze, wasn't it? That's one of the moments that we've just got to keep on camera, I think. Oh, that was one of the best, actually. I mean, I, I get these sort of um, fuzzy moments, but that, that was an absolute classic. And all that time... was a classic. I mean... These are completely unedited, unabridged versions. We don't add, we don't take away. You get it raw from us. We've got some absolute biggies coming under under uh, P. 
So I'm wondering what what P we can squeeze in in five in the five minutes we have left on on, on today's. I think one that we can oh, squeeze we in. Yeah, go go jumping, for it. Jumping a bit ahead of ourselves, perhaps on this one. I think we could squeeze in pound cost averaging, which is sometimes called dollar cost averaging, but only if you live on the other side of the big pond. I think that's a that's a reasonably um easy one. Well, I, I was so, reading uh, a book from your mentor. And oh. he, he talks in dollars, so he must have been American, was he? He would have been a dollar cost averager. Yes, yes, he was a, a, an American citizen, and um, he uh, he lived to an absolutely ripe old age. I think he was ninety eight when when he uh, shuffled off to that great big property empire in the sky. And on his um, uh, gravestone, he said, "You know, to, to a young immigrant from whatever his country was, you know, who who, who was given the opportunity in, in this great land that he wouldn't have had anywhere else." He, was, he remained very humble right until the end and and yet he did a lot of amazing things that that you and i wouldn't have had i mean you and i might do them now but we wouldn't have had a hope of doing them in 1930 because they hadn't been invented so so he did a lot of stuff and had a lot of humility and and i think humility is is very important actually in in this game and and in the whole of life really yeah no really he writes a good book i i've not finished the book yet but uh i've been enjoying it i've been enjoying I'm it. i'm glad you appreciate it i'm glad you appreciate it and coming back to what you did last week on on negotiation one of his things was uh, win-win that they always try to uh, achieve the best outcomes for everybody and he always lit really strove hard to achieve that and that's in part the measure of his success and um, there was a time when he was negotiating wasn't there which, which just reminded me with um, uh, a trade union leader and a boss about one of his um, office buildings which was uh, absolutely supreme we could actually take a little side uh, track and and and, and um, actually uh, fin- shall we finish off with that little story at the end of today's one because that'd be a great way to fill three minutes and um, you probably just <coughs> read... explain who who uh, this gentleman is briefly yes um, m- m- my mentor um, George was was um, well he, he he was a fellow who escaped the Russian Revolution Revolution by the skin of his um, neck, literally, um, uh, got out of his country with his mother, smuggled in a hay cart, and, 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 and then made his way in a very sort of treacherous and, and, and difficult way to the United States of America by being sort of below decks on a ship with the ship pitching and rolling and everything and not only being allowed upstairs about five minutes a day to lean over the side for a bit and all that horrible stuff. And then he has, it was it Ellis Island, the place that he arrived uh, next to the Statue of Liberty uh, with, with just their little suitcase and, and, and um, they, they, they not speaking any English, not having any money. And, and, and America was very welcoming at that point to, 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 to refugees and, and, and they were able to build a new life. And he went through college and he became an estate agent for a bit. And then he got a bit bored with that and started doing some quite um, interesting and and, and um, unusual deals and uh, putting up commercial buildings. I mean, that is a very ambitious thing for a small estate agent to do. And he, he, he definitely had a, a huge amount of, um, what shall we say, confidence in his own abilities and a lot of support from his missus because he's just like, ah, oh, all the stuff we've built up over the last 10 or 15 years, can we put it all on the line so I can build this commercial building? She goes, yes, dear, no, what, what, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah. Um, and so well, one of his commercial buildings um, had <clears throat> an anchor tenant, which was going to be an electrical company. Uh, and they said, we will occupy the whole ground floor of your building on condition that throughout this building, you only put sockets and switches and whatever made by our company. We want our brand stamped on the entire building. Um, unfortunately, at this time, this electrical company was having a dispute with the electrician's union. So the shop steward knocks on his door. He says, I've got to tell you, I hear this firm's moving in. If you put even so much as one light fitting made by this firm on your building, we're going to blacklist you. We'll have a whole uh, ring of people encircling your building and we'll bring the whole project uh, to an immediate standstill. So George was a terribly wise person. He's a bit like that fellow Solomon in the Bible. And so he kind of thought about this for a bit uh, and he invited to dinner both the head of the um, electrical company and the boss of the trade union. And he just sat them opposite each other at the table. He was at the end. uh, And he just spent an evening talking about his philosophy of doing the right thing, of how he'd helped to provide uh, homes for ex-servicemen coming back at the end of the Second World War, and how he liked to make win-win outcomes, create employment, and all, all all his values. Not a word was spoken about this dispute. And at the end, uh, the, the guys shook hands and went their separate ways. The next day, uh, George rings up his workers and he says, right, I'd like you to order 50 percent of fittings from this electrical company and we'll fit those. And I'd like you to order 50 percent of fittings from somewhere else. 
Uh, he proceeded to implement that throughout the building. The electricians didn't strike and the firm moved in. Game over. If that isn't a brilliant today, a, a example of, of, of sort of win-win and how to do a, a negotiation that isn't in your face, that does meet everybody's objectives, which he knew about, so he didn't even have to ask. And, and, and just to use this a bit, and, and that's just breathtaking. And there's some other ones that we can throw in of his in future weeks, maybe, if you like. No, I think that was brilliant. And it, it's a thoroughly enjoyable read. And, uh, well, we'll have to see if we can get that out uh, somewhere for, for people to know about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's top stuff and we can we can do some talks about that at some point when we finish a to z or something we can talk about some of the things that happened in this fella's life and in our lives and and, and there's lots of sort of stuff there's lots of sort of stuff did i tell you the one about da, 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 da. no brilliant well i think we've run out of time for today and that was a really good anecdote to finish on uh of one of david's mentors who is a really phenomenal guy who achieved so much uh, in a time without internet, communication, network marketing, there was no YouTube, there was no Google. Wow. Respect. Indeed. Indeed. On that note, it's goodbye from me. And, uh, and, uh, and goodbye from me. Drop your comments in the box below. See you next week.